So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for <clears throat> joining on a Monday evening after the long weekend. I'm sure this must be a hectic Monday for everyone. So thank you uh, so much for being a part of this uh, session today. So this session is an initiative of WIN, which is Women's in Women Investors Network. Women Investors Network is an initiative by Finfix. to educate women and make them proactive on matters related to investments and personal finance my name is shaina i'm the editor of in medium and uh, my host alongside is uh, prableen vajpai who is the founder and uh, uh, creator of finfix uh, and win itself finfix is a research um, and investment firm uh, our guest tonight our uh, stalwarts from the mutual fund industry and as our topic uh, today is simplifying mutual funds and investing so today through this session we are trying to demystify the world of mutual funds uh, which which uh, may seem like a very complicated uh, complex high risk uh, arena to enter in but we'll simplify that with help of our speakers and guests today so uh, our speakers are kalpen parekh uh, who is the md and ceo of dsp mutual fund the name well known to everyone and uh, along with him uh, we have ashish samaya ashish uh, after creating uh, doing some amazing work at the Mot- at motilal uh, oswal amc is now set to rev up uh, white oak capital management uh, in the retail mutual fund space so thank you so much kalpen and ashish uh, for being a part agreeing to be a part of this session uh, we are really really uh, obliged so without further ado we'd like to uh, uh, start this session so prableen over to you uh thanks so much china and uh, welcome uh, kalpen and ashish and we are very excited and honored to have you both as our guest speakers today uh so i think we'll just get started with the first question and um, kalpen my first question is actually for you and uh, it's about uh, you know touching the basics let's say we have a new investor what are the two three important factors related to mutual funds um which a first time investor should understand before starting Hi, uh, their am journey. Hi, am I audible, Prabhleen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you hear me, Kalpen? Hello. Ah, uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Kalpen? I can't hear you. Ah, uh, Shana, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Prabhleen. Ah, uh, I can hear you. Okay, Kalpen, can you hear me now? Ah, uh, I think ah uh, he's no more a speaker. I think he's dropped off, and uh, we'll. I think let's connect with uh, he'll he'll join back I guess. Ah, uh, so probably ah uh, I'll just I think, uh, put this yeah. question to Ashish. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, so Ashish, uh, probably you can answer this. That what are the yeah. two three most important factors related to mutual funds and investing, which a first time investor ah uh, should understand before starting off his or her journey, ah uh, investment journey. Sure. So I think you know. see it's i think the realization is important that mutual funds are just basically an instrument uh, or a way to invest so it's not so much about uh, which mutual fund to buy and you know how to buy it i think all of that comes later uh, the first thing you know like uh, when you you know when you think a bit in spiritual terms uh, they say that all the answers lie within so the same logic applies here which is that what is one really investing for you know what is the reason to invest uh, what exactly are you seeking Uh, you know what are your goals? Uh, you know how do you want your money to uh, really fare uh, over a period of time? So I think it's all about first. You know the first thing is to understand what is the reason for investing, uh, and whatever money you are looking to invest, uh, you know what kind of distance or uh, journey, uh, what distance to be travelled, and what journey to kind of have with that money. So only if you know why you are investing, only then uh, you can know uh, where really uh, to invest. and mutual funds are obviously just one of the uh, one of the instruments uh, also uh, not only instrument it's just a vehicle actually because ultimately mutual funds can put your money into uh, bonds and uh, put your money into stock markets so mutual funds again you know are not the be all and end all they are just a instrument or a via media 
so most important thing maybe i'm repeating myself but most important thing is first to know why you are investing uh, second thing is that uh, you know even if all things being equal let us say there are two people both investing uh, for the same thought process or same goals uh, still uh, some people have some uh, you know risk tolerance they might have a view uh, in terms of what type of journey uh, can they really uh, take you know let's say if you are driving from delhi to chandigarh Uh, there will still be some people who would prefer to go by train, some who would go by plane, uh, some who would go by road, and even on the road, some would drive fast and some would drive slow. So, first is why are you investing? Second is what type of journey or what type of uh, you know risk tolerance you have? How fast do you want to get there? So, I think these are some things to really keep in mind before trying to uh, you know venture into the whole space. So, I think which mutual fund and all comes much later. Understanding why one is investing. Uh, and what type of journey is one uh, willing to take i think that is most important right oh, wonderful thanks uh, kalpin uh, because uh, you had dropped off uh, so would you like to add something to this sure. you know ashish has mentioned uh, why and uh, your risk uh, tolerance okay so let me start with disclaimers because you know we always have disclaimers in our ads uh, i um, head a mutual fund company so hence i will largely speak everything good about mutual funds at the same time what i say is authentic because uh, almost 99% of my uh, lifetime savings uh, is in mutual funds so whatever i'm saying is coming from uh, deep beliefs and experience of 22 years as a consumer not as uh, a mutual fund professional in my view mutual fund can allow you as an investor to either be a loaner or an owner what i mean by this is um, you know it allows you to invest uh, in debt as an asset class by lending money to you know companies who want to borrow money at interest rates that you typically get in uh, fixed income in- instruments or it allows you to be an owner of businesses by participating in equity funds so that's my first a uh, simplistic definition of what a mutual fund is you can either lend money to businesses and get more steady state returns similar to what you get in um, uh, fixed income instruments or you can be like an owner of a business where the returns will fluctuate over a short or a medium term time horizon but over a longer period of time if these businesses do well you end up creating significant wealth like how most successful businesses do uh, the third thing about mutual funds is they are extremely transparent they are highly regulated and well regulated uh, they are very cost efficient uh, they are tax efficient because they get certain tax advantages that you know most instruments otherwise do not get because uh, the government wants to encourage investors to come through this disciplined vehicle of investing and lastly they are a vehicle like ashi said they are a vehicle uh, which can allow you as an investor to invest across any time horizon there are funds where you can invest for just 24 hours and take the money out there are funds where you can invest for your next generation over the next 20 or 30 years as well as the entire range in between so they are a very flexible uh, vehicle which will allow you to invest for different time horizons different goals and lastly they allow you to invest across asset classes so you want to replace your savings account there are mutual funds for that you want to replace your fixed deposits in a more tax efficient way there are debt funds for that you want to buy global companies and uh, you know invest in some of the world class companies globally you can do that you want to buy commodities like oil and metals and gold you can do that and you want to buy traditional simple equity indian businesses you can do that so these are uh, you know this is the wide gamut that mutual fund offers the flip side to all this choice is uh, you know you could get overwhelmed or you could get confused and that's where you know learning what each mutual fund does what each asset class uh, mutual fund offers in terms of risk and rewards becomes very important before you start your journey thanks wonderful thanks thanks kalpin Uh, so uh ashish i would you know as kalpen just said that you know uh, there could be various there are various categories right from an overnight mm-hmm. fund to something which allows you to invest for generations so um, along in amongst these categories and sub categories uh how does one decide allocation you know within these categories yeah so i think uh, what is most important you know is to first uh, determine like i mentioned at the onset what exactly are you uh, really investing for uh, so so say for example uh, somebody has a young child <clears throat> okay let's say there's a 3 4 year old child and over the number of years uh, 
you know let us say uh, say over next 7 8 10 12 years uh, you are looking to create a corpus you know which can grow to a sizable sum and ensure uh, that when you know the higher level of studies or higher expenses kind of start to kick in uh, one has a uh, separate uh, corpus uh, for the uh, child's education uh, to go through uh, smoothly so let's just take that as an example now as you'll appreciate uh, de- uh, this child's education is just one example which i have given but depending on the uh, life stage uh, depending on the structure of the family uh, depending on you know what type of dependence a person has uh, in the family so every person will have individual circumstances but broadly speaking uh, depending on individual circumstances different people will have different uh, goals uh, to achieve or let's say different Uh, you know types of corpuses or different types of requirements to really uh, plan for correct so let's stick to this child's education bit okay and let us imagine uh, that you need to arrive at a particular corpus let's theoretically say that the corpus is 20 lakh rupees uh, which is required uh, say 7 uh, or 8 years uh, down the line correct now you need to figure out how much uh, are you going to be able to save Uh, each and every month so let's say that uh, you are going to be able to save 20000 rupees a month or say 10000 rupees a month now needless to say child's education uh, is just one goal there will be other goals like there will be a goal related to say retirement uh, there could be a goal related to say a house purchase right so first and most important thing is for someone to sit back uh, and write down or someone to sit back and uh, kind of you know figure out what goals is one looking to achieve and over what kind of time frame the second is what is your ability uh, to save uh, you know uh, after meeting your current expenses uh, so once you are clear that how much can you save and what type of goals uh, you wish to achieve over what time frame that will tell you what's the bridge by bridge i mean uh, over how many years Uh, how much money you will be able to invest and at what rate you want that money to grow so as to be reasonably close to uh, that goal amount and it's obvious that if your income uh, and your expenses are such that you are not able to save enough then clearly you need to be realistic about which goals you can achieve and which ones are more important or less important or more critical or less critical uh, and then you would need to kind of prioritize so for a moment let's assume that there's this person with one single goal uh, and only one single important priority which is the child's education so if you want to reach say 10 lakh rupees in the next uh, say 10 years and you're going to save say 10000 say 20000 rupees per month so obviously you're going to end up saving um, you know say if you say 20000 per month you're going to end up saving 2.4 lakhs a year right so it's more than enough to reach 10 lakhs so you can put in one more goal out there but the point is that you need to understand how much will you save every month at what rate that money needs to grow to ensure that there is a reasonable probability that the goal will be achieved at that appropriate juncture in time and then that would determine where to invest so typically if you if you come up with a goal and if you come up with a set of numbers which says that the money needs to grow at more than 10 12% uh, then it's very clear that you cannot put that money into bank deposits or savings accounts or fixed income or assets of those types then you would need to put that money into equity now within equity also you know what type of equity i mean is it going to be a mid cap fund is it a fund which invests in large companies is it a fund which invests in mid size companies so we'll leave that complication for later but uh, i hope what i'm explaining is clear so far and you know also i would like to say that all of this uh, is i mean i know that even when i'm talking it is sounding complex so you can imagine that while you really set out to do it it's not going to be easy right uh, so obviously it needs help of professionals it need helps it, it needs help uh, from an advisor uh, but yeah broadly uh, that's the process maybe i said it before also but i would say that you know unless you know where you are going you can't begin the journey uh, i think that is what is most important thank you ashish yes very very well explained and uh goals to define where we put our money in uh actually breaking this down further kalpen uh, uh 
a lot of emphasis suddenly has come on uh, international funds i mean there was a big hue and cry when when the when the when a lot of fund houses stopped taking these funds due to the limit uh, uh, breach you know the limit uh, reached and uh, there is also another category which has become popular which is the gold funds because suddenly the gold prices have shot up now a person whose allocation is set uh, how does one is it necessary or is it is it uh, you know is it something that should be done uh, like some part should be invested in international funds and some part should be invested in commodity funds so how important or unimportant is that uh, shaina this is a function of what stage an investor is in terms of his uh... majority of uh, understanding um, you know various levels and uh, layers of risk uh, in different mutual funds so you know since uh, i i think the objective of this session is simplifying mutual funds for new investors um, commodity investing thematic investing comes uh, very late in the journey for a new investor i would say that the simplest thing to do is uh, have uh, uh, you know a hybrid fund with 70% equity and 30% bonds to start with um, as 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 a good product which will probably deliver returns better than 95% of investors over long periods of time uh, in our language we call it the equity and bond fund uh, or any hybrid fund but uh, since you asked me a specific question i for one have always believed that um, you know you should invest uh, in good companies i don't uh, classify my investing through the label that uh, the investing world has given in terms of large caps mid caps small caps multi caps there are 20 labels all these labels ultimately enable you to buy two or three asset classes which is indian equities global equities and bonds and even you know gold and commodities all these labels do is they allow you to own businesses businesses have characteristics like 15 to 20% return on equity 10 to 15% profit growth rate available at a certain price and a certain valuation Uh, so you know i i want investors to recognize that ultimately through all the 20 25 30 tables and jargons that you keep hearing or you know reading in media or through our conversation ultimately uh, you know what are you doing is you're buying businesses so what is important whenever you are deciding about investing in a fund is to ask what are you investing in what are where is your money eventually going uh, and in that construct um you know there are great businesses in india uh, which have created wealth over the last 30 years and will do in the next uh, 20 30 years at the same time there are great businesses outside india uh, more dominant businesses or uh, in in areas where you know india does not have an edge so uh, in in our portfolio in my own portfolio i have around 20 to 25% in international stocks through global funds um and uh, i i i you know i don't invest there uh, because the last 3 year returns have been good in fact a lot of appetite for global investing as you rightly said china has uh, you know emerged in the last 2 years not because people love global investing but because the last 5 year returns are very good we launched our uh, global investing range in 2008 for the next 10 years till 2018 we barely got uh, any inflows uh, you know but because the last decade uh, global uh, american companies did better uh, compared to you know india as a market overall past returns uh, created a lure for investing there so in my view a lot of investors you know today are uh, in affection of global investing not for the right reason that you know they they help you in diversifying your uh, underlying opportunity they help you uh, in you know getting a better nav journey a lower uh, volatility uh, for similar sort of returns they give you you know some exposure to lo- dollar assets uh, they they help you diversify away from rupee as a currency and you know minimize the currency volatility that india typically demonstrates every few years so global investing is valuable but one should understand the right reasons for that and to me the right reasons are in getting a chance to invest in uh, you know international currencies and uh, international businesses which are robust as dominant or more dominant than indian companies and at times they are available at cheaper valuations so today uh, you know for a auto company if if i get a good auto company at 40 times price to earning in uh, india Uh, the parent of the same company may be available at 15 or 20 times it may be growing at marginally lower growth rates but is reasonably cheap so what happens is when indian stocks become very expensive many times global stocks in similar industries are cheaper so when you blend the two together you get a much uh, you know powerful uh, combination and let me give you one statistic uh, when when it comes to gold if you take the last 20 year returns of nifty for example roughly it is around 12% 
and the last 20 year return of gold is also around 12% and if you do a portfolio which is 50 50 nifty and gold mathematically the average of the two should also give 12% return right 12 plus 12 24 divided by 2 but actually if you blend a portfolio like this and rebalance every year or every 3 years your actual return will be 13.5% you will actually earn slightly more than the sum of uh, the average of the two uh, asset classes with lower volatility now this happens because both asset classes equity and gold have very different journeys there are times when equity goes up gold remains flat there are times when equity cracks and gold rises like in the last 2 3 months so i think um, there is merit in having all these asset classes but my approach would be to go aggressive in an asset class which has underperformed in the last 5 years extensively rather than do the opposite which is go aggressive in an asset class which has delivered much higher return so both gold and uh, global investing merit uh, you know serious uh, exposure in our portfolios but be very thoughtful do not invest just because past returns are very high thank you uh, uh thanks kalpin um so my next question is actually for the both of you and i'll start with uh, ashish uh you know you uh, kalpin you just mentioned different asset classes and i think as indians we all just uh, love real estate in fact i have met so many people who have uh, you know two or even three home loans and they are so uh, they are somehow the risk appetite goes up when it comes to real estate because they are so confident uh, that it is a hard asset and it's going to give some sort of returns to them and uh, people with a very high net worth also sometimes allocate a very small amount uh, of their money to equities and uh, yet what they expect is a uh, very high returns uh, they really don't want much volatility or risk though they are not the same things and uh, i think that question that uh, i hope hum kabhi bhi paisa nikal sakte hain why is that confidence still lacking and why does this exist is it because we've been used to uh, i mean is real estate a traditional asset class that uh, majority of us or you know the previous generations have seen and how can we bridge this gap this uh, the attitude towards different assets is so different yeah so you know probably i think that even when it comes to real estate uh, my sense is that the millennials or you know people who are in their 20s and 30s today probably their they probably their uh, attitude towards real estate uh, i'm quite sure is different from what it has been uh, in the past uh, my i personally don't think that people who are right now in their 20s or early 30s uh, i'm not sure i don't think that they really think about uh, real estate as the go to asset class or the most comfortable asset class uh, to be in for obvious reasons one of course is you know the affordability and the ticket size itself but beyond that also my sense is that uh, people who are young today uh, they don't seem to be seeing real estate as a uh, investment related asset class i think there has been uh, for a long point in time at least last 10 years i think there has been significant disenchantment uh, with how real estate has uh, played out but i do get the point which you are saying that you know if you look at somebody who is in their 40s or 50s or somebody who would say qualify as a high net worth uh, investor a lot of these or traditionally people who have been investing a lot of these people still hold real estate very close to their heart and i do agree that you know even i have seen people uh, they have one home and a second home and a third one and always figuring out how to get a fourth one uh, and you know i think post pandemic a lot of people have had you know more house purchases uh, at least in the metro cities and also you know those weekend homes and those kinds of things so there is definitely a segment which is very very much in love with real estate and i think uh, maybe two or three reasons uh, first of course is the uh, you know i don't know how many people realize this but the ability to see and touch and feel uh, i think is very very important because all said and done uh, while we are in a digital world you know money being entirely digital i don't think is people are still very comfortable with so for example if you have a house which you put on rent or if you have at least a house you know which is even if it is locked you can see it and you can visit it and you know that there is a hard asset out there uh, clearly uh, that probably seems more valuable to quite a few people uh, than actually receiving an sms uh, or an email uh, about what assets you are actually uh, holding so i think there is always that allure of uh, hard assets uh, which i don't think one can really uh, wish away um, because that does give comfort to some people the other important thing clearly is that you know when you see real estate 
people do believe that uh, you know generally because the price is not uh, disclosed so there's there's absolutely no transparency plus there is a lack of liquidity and lack of quotations you know look when it comes to infosys share price uh, or when it comes to a mutual fund nav uh, whether you want it or not the price is disclosed every day and there are days when the price goes up and there are days when the price goes down and i think that price movement uh, is always something which is a trigger for uh, not necessarily action but definitely a trigger for some kind of review uh, playing out in the subconscious mind when it comes to real estate clearly unless and until you go looking uh, nobody is really going to uh, call you uh, and you know tell you what the price of that asset is in fact quite likely that if you have a priced asset uh, you will get a quotation for you to be able to sell it at a higher price uh, but you generally don't get somebody calling you saying i want to buy your house 20% lower than what you originally bought it for so i think this whole quotation business uh, and you know prices being thrown around i think that really really matters a lot uh, so uh, you know the price quotation the transparency uh, i think people don't really go around finding out uh, how much their house would sell for today if they wanted to sell so i think a lot of these things uh, are you know there but people do assume uh, people just assume that just because the prices are not quoted uh, people assume that the price must not be really uh, going down right uh, so i think these issues are there which are more related to uh, psychology but we all know that when it comes to real estate the fact is uh, that transaction costs are exorbitant maintenance costs are exorbitant right uh, illiquidity is an issue Uh, clearly uh, so there are many many issues with uh, plus of course you know i think the other major challenge is that real estate real estate is all about location 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 uh, so all those challenges persist but i think people still have perceptual issues uh, because of uh, transparency and availability of data i think that one thing uh, really distorts you know, how people look at uh, asset classes the fact is that when you have when you own financial assets and the price gets quoted you know the fact is that you should be ignoring the price because it's not for you to sell it's like this you know when you board a metro train uh, let us say if you are going from uh, you know connaught place to terminal 3 uh, you know every few mom- every few minutes uh, the metro train stops and the doors open uh, you don't get off every time the door opens you know you stick to it because you want to go to the airport you will get off when the doors open for the airport right so every time the metro opens the train uh, opens the doors doesn't mean you're going to get off and then climb back in that's the same thing about price quotations so just because your nav is disclosed every day doesn't mean you're going to either buy or you're going to sell you will decide to sell when you need the money i think that's the issue with price quotations and uh, transparency and i think that is the biggest distortion uh, psychologically uh, between owning real estate versus owning a financial asset uh, you know where the price is quoted to you right right ashish uh, kalpin you've just uh, got a house so yeah. of course you're not uh, amongst those who's a, a real estate uh, you know who's in love with real estate what's your take on this sure no i just wanted to add that uh, you know uh, after almost um, uh, 15 20 years of living in a rented house and the logic was that uh, rental yield in real estate in mumbai uh, it has been around 2% for the last decade or so if i invest in a simple triple a rated uh, uh, short term fund uh, i would have won 6 to 7% return in the last 5 to 10 years and uh, you know the dividend yield of equity as an asset class is 2 to 1/2% with embedded growth in it so very mathematically real estate uh, to me doesn't make sense uh, when i you know use a rational lens of course my f- mother and wife and uh, sister uh, you know do have a very different take when it comes to real estate from an emotional lens and that is a valid reason for one to really own uh, real estate so there is a different joy of having your own home and you know doing it up and living in it uh, and for which uh, there should be no debate uh, rationality should not uh, come in the way but having done that is real estate uh, an investment vehicle i would look at it only in a down cycle where real estate prices for 10 years have gone nowhere or have crashed and i have too much of money to allocate then i would think of it but you know at large in india for the per capita that we have we are all middle class indians we do not have really you know tons and tons of wealth to keep investing in so many asset classes so in a way it becomes a very theoretical question the third point i want to make is when i wanted to buy you know my home uh, in uh, august uh, and i had to pay, make a fairly you know large amount of that i had to just press uh, five buttons to get all the liquidity to make the payment 
within 24 hours and 72 hours. So whatever I redeemed from, let's say, my debt investments, it was T plus one and all my equity fund investment was T plus three. So within 24 to 72 hours, the entire capital was available with liquidity and with reasonably high amount of tax efficiency and very low or virtually zero impact cost. I also have a small home in the suburbs of Mumbai, which I wanted to sell so that I can, you know, offset the capital gains there into this new house. But trust me, since August till now, um, you know, it has been a struggle uh, in terms of getting brokers to come and see that place. And then, you know, um, um, a, a long time negotiating on the prices and there will be impact cost, stamp duty and all of that. So I, I for one, uh, very rationally believe that, um, you know, simple equity, debt and commodity, you know, mutual funds over a 10, 20, 30 year period end up giving similar or better returns than real estate unless you, you get lucky in some pockets where, you know, real estate prices really go through the roof. And the last thing on this is today, if you want to compare, uh, you know, mutual fund returns, you get NAVs every day. Like Ashish mentioned, price discovery is not there. Now, this transparency and price discovery actually goes against an investor remaining for the long term in mutual funds because every time you see a price, you end up reacting. In fact, have you noticed any, uh, you know, panel discussion or any article or any Twitter spaces saying that, you know, if Ukraine and Russia have happened, what is the implication on real estate? Uh, most conversations are implication on equities and, you know, mutual fund investing and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of short term events that keep happening. Um, uh, we as an industry also react to every event and try to, you know, uh, find answers to every event, even though we may not have the answer, even you know, Putin or um, the, the Ukrainian president wouldn't have an answer to what will happen. But we seem to have answers. So sometimes we over communicate to our investors, which creates short termism. And to your question, probably in how to solve for this, I think we as an industry will have to, you know, make very clear choices that if you are here for long term, do not even bother about some of the short term events. No point in, you know, um, answering questions where we don't have an answer, but creating illusion of expertise and, and thus help the investor develop his long-term muscle, which he demonstrates when he invests in real estate and gold and fixed deposit. Gold goes to the next generation. If FDs go to the next generation, but for, you know, stocks and equity funds, the holding periods are just two or three years. So we collectively will have to make an effort to talk the language of long-term and help investors uh, build their wealth. Thanks. Wonderful. Absolutely. I think uh, so uh, focus more on uh, the long-term goals. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I think as we've discussed, uh, you know, how to step into investing, what is the allocation going to be and, you know, uh, how to have goals defined. So uh, while we invest in mutual funds, I mean, is is there a set way as to how a retail investor who did not know so much, but knows just a, a basic bit about mutual funds, uh, monitors their funds and what 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 should be the monitoring process of these funds? Should it just be the returns or are there some red flags that, uh, you know, that uh, shouldn't be ignored or should be, uh, you know, really, really uh, an investor should be careful of those. So Ashish, would you want to answer that? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, the yardstick for measurement will clearly depend on what type of uh, fund it is, right? Uh, when it comes to say equity oriented funds, a uh, couple of things that one needs to really keep in mind. One is like, uh, I think I like what Kalpin mentioned, that uh, if you're a first-time investor, uh, then doing something as simple as buying a hybrid fund, you know, which allocates your money between uh, equity and fixed income or a balanced advantage fund, you know, which puts your money, uh, divides your money between equity and fixed income. I think some of these hybrid products, uh, they clearly make a lot of sense if you're a first-time investor. Uh, but having said so, you know, when you mention about uh, so, you know, when you when you take, let's say, a hybrid fund, for instance, I think the yardstick for comparison would be clearly, uh, you know, there are benchmarks available. Uh, so what type of benchmark, as in what is the fund supposed to compare its performance to? Uh, so clearly, one is uh, that's a benchmark. Uh, second is peer group comparison. You know, what are other comparable funds doing? I think that's another way to look at it. Third thing, I think, to keep life simple, why does one really put money into a hybrid fund? Ultimately, because, you know, you're not happy with fixed income. And at the same time, you don't have appetite, uh, you know, to go the whole hog uh, into equity. So if it is beating, uh, say, you know, typically fixed income in our country, I don't think there is anything giving more than 6 
So while you can do very complex analysis of which is the right benchmark, which are the right peer groups, what should a fund be compared with? And of course, you know, fund managers, because they charge a fee, they, obviously they need to deliver on all these counts. But as far as the investor is concerned, you know, if you're a new investor, if you're just beginning your journey, then I think the complex analysis should come later. You first need to keep in mind, why did you get into such a fund? Because, you know, you're not happy with fixed income. You're not happy with real estate. And you're looking to achieve something better. So the key point is, is it really delivering you what you forget all the benchmarks and the comparisons at an absolute level? Is it really delivering the kind of return or is it delivering you what you really set out to achieve? So I think these are a few things to keep in mind. Also, since I took an example of a hybrid fund, I just kind of uh, took, it, took it up from what Kalpain mentioned that where should a new investor start from? So if you are, for example, talking about a hybrid fund, uh, what should be the frequency of evaluation? I think you need to review at least review at best maybe once in a year. You know, I think uh, like we've already been discussing out here, uh, every day NAV is declared um, or, you know, every maybe every three months you might receive some account statement on email or something doesn't mean you set to review and compare everything. Because, you know, in my uh, in my journey over the last say, couple of decades in the industry, what I've seen is that uh, there are many investors who say, I mean, every, basically everybody says I am a long-term investor, but some people are long-term from a 24-hour perspective and for some people long-term is one month and for some people long-term is one year. There are very few for whom long-term is really long-term, which is basically 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, what it should be, right? So the point is that long term is actually 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But for a lot of people, long term is, you know, if the markets are booming and your value is appreciating, uh, then long term is practically every day, right? And when the markets are gone, you know, things are looking bad, uh, then they kind of lose interest. So I think that the evaluation frequency, if we are talking hybrid funds, equity funds, the frequency of evaluation should be annual, Right. Uh, and also keep in mind that, you know, uh, every year, so if you're going to figure out that, okay, this is the benchmark or this is the peer group against which I'm evaluating this fund, you will find that more often than not, uh, the best performer this year may not be the best performer next year. So also a lot of context in terms of how portfolios are created, why they perform in a particular manner. So I think evaluating something with a window less than one year, especially in hybrid or equity, uh, may not make sense uh, really and the last thing which i will say is that you know when you are investing in variable return products especially you know because all mutual funds are variable return products when you are investing in variable return products you know you should keep score but you should not pronounce winners and losers uh, every day or every month uh, because situations and context you know will evolve something which is looking really bad uh, will suddenly start looking very good uh, you know, if the market turns or if the context really uh, changes. So I think keeping score, even when you talk about evaluation, while I said that one year or longer is the ideal evaluation period, also keep in mind that when it comes to the overall investment, uh, keeping score is important, but jumping to pronounce winners and losers is not really the best way to uh, go about it. So that's what I want to share. Maybe Kalpin wants to add something. Uh, I think brilliant point, Ashish, what you mentioned uh that you know this is a variable return uh, product category unlike um, you know banks uh, where they can give a fixed rate of return for fixed deposits uh, you know most of us are wired uh, from inception to think fixed returns and uh, the first question that you asked probably in that you know what should investors be aware about mutual funds i think if they need to know one thing this is a variable return product there is no assurance of um, the return broadly 99.999% of times, if the investor well behaves and chooses the fund right, uh, he will end up earning the return that that fund or the asset class uh, inherently can deliver. But there will be fluctuations every day because we publish our LEVs every day and we reflect the changes in the markets every day. So the variability of returns is something which is, you know, seldom 
highlighted um, in a simple language so while we may have a 100 page disclaimer and uh, you know very complex risk meters but i don't think any investor really looks at that so this is a very powerful point that ashish mentioned and i think it will go a long way in building trust and transparency up front if investors know that yes if i'm investing in a debt fund debt fund uh, you know on a rolling three year basis the worst return has been 4% the best has been 8% basis today's interest rate scenario most likely return could be 6% so coming with this type of awareness uh, you know really can go a long way uh, i i have uh, examples where you know i have shown to an investor who recently wants to invest in equity because the last three year returns are very good and when i show that you know if your holding period is 3 years your worst case return was minus 5 your best case return was plus 40 but the median return was roughly around 16 to 17% it is the minus 5 which makes him think that okay uh, is this right for me am i willing to lose minus 5 if my luck is bad and if not then i should not invest in an equity fund then maybe a hybrid fund or an- another product is better for me so if we, we all collectively you know work towards highlighting this concept it will really be a great service to our investors and uh, you know just last point uh, to this question um, uh, that you asked Uh, if you look at the richest man or the richest investor who we all quote very often warren buffett told his wife that after me if you have to invest in a in a very efficient and simple way just by uh, you know the s&p index fund and um, the the us uh, treasury so which again is a you know reflection of what me and ashish are trying to say uh, having learned from uh, icons like him that a sensible hybrid strategy equity and debt combination in a low cost format could be a very good starting point for a novice investor thank you uh, superb uh, thanks so much ashish and kalpen for uh, the wonderful inputs and uh, i think um, uh, shaina we'll open for uh, audience questions now uh, i think uh, so i think we're getting a lot of requests so we thought we'll cut down on the questions that we are asking and uh, you know allow our audience actually to ask you some questions directly yes so uh, i mean whoever ha- wants to ask can resend their request because there were a lot of requests and they've gone on so you can resend your request to add us uh, at uh, you as a speaker uh, uh, i've added one person so mr alok you can please go ahead and ask your question please address who you are asking the question to ah uh, mr alok i think you'll have to unmute yourself unmute yourself yeah confusion here he is dropped out so if uh, okay i'm adding vine as a speaker mr alok is also back as a speaker ah uh, so uh, vine are you there as a speaker I've added okay, a few. Uh, I've added a Shraban, few. Shraban, uh, probably you can ask your question if you're connected now. Or Deepak, if you are there, whoever is whoever wants to ask can go ahead. Actually, just unmute and go ahead. Deepak, uh, do you want to ask a question? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes, yes you are. Great. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I actually don't have a question. I just wanted to add to what uh, Ashish and Kalpen were uh, mentioning about real estate. See, one very important aspect besides all the points, of course, Kalpen and Ashish highlighted, a very important aspect which goes in favor of real estate vis-a-vis a mutual fund is the fact that real uh, estate allows people to leverage. So, if a youngster with a twenty lakh corpus invests into an equity mutual fund for after five years. even if his money doubles his 40 lakh rupee worth in added to his net worth but with 20 lakh rupees he's able to go out and buy a house leveraging four times taking 80% loan a 1 crore property and even if it gives him a 10% cake kegger uh, he still ends up having greater wealth so one reason why in india and of course investments all about behavior one reason why a lot of investors prefer to go real estate way is because it allows them and the easiest leverage because if he leverages in equity which is not advisable or anybody else any other asset class he will probably be called by the lender to uh, make good the margins which doesn't happen in real estate the second point which i wanted to highlight 
the all the positives of the mutual fund actually go against it as an investment class so daily nav uh, the liquidity so imagine a mutual fund industry instead of a 3 year lock in had a 10 year lock in period investors would actually end up making much greater wealth leave aside of course amcs which will also have a good uh, income on fee but the fact that there is no lock in period long lock in period kind of products uh, investors are not able to make that kind of wealth in equity those are the two points which i wanted to add thanks thank you deepak uh, shavan you can ask your question yeah good evening uh, i want to ask the question to problem Prab- madam so actually i have a uh, three queries uh, recently i have closed my lsc policy and i started investing in the equity and i started for my son uh, i started uh, mutual funds of parak parik flexi cap and uh, uh, pgim flexi cap apart from this uh, i invested some uh, lump sum amount in some mef funds uh, etf so apart from this uh, i invested some uh, money in the stocks is that sufficient or is there any suggestion to increase my uh, 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 portfolio to 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 build the wealth are sir aapko kal pe na ashish ko question puchna hai we are not going to analyze portfolios you can uh, send me a dm you know i'll help you with the, uh, this then okay okay ma'am thank you okay uh mr alok i don't know he's here as a speaker uh i also added shri uh, as a speaker so you can unmute and please ask your question hello uh chiraz otherwise uh, you can, uh, can go ahead and can, ask your can, question can you hear me ma'am yeah okay shri yeah yeah please uh, go ahead go, uh, good evening everyone uh, my question is uh, that uh, Uh, nowadays uh, a lot of uh, large cap fund are uh, not able to beat uh, this nifty 50 and uh, there are many index fund uh, which are doing good but recently there are uh, mat- mat- specific uh, etfs are there mutual fund uh, like momentum 30 and uh, value investing so mujhe ye puchna tha main matlab which is the better one जो कि लॉन्ग टर्म में चल के इंडेक्स को मतलब निफ्टी फिफ्टी को आउट परफॉर्म कर सके इट विल बी मतलब गुड इंडेक्स फंड और ये हमें जो अभी नए थीम्स निकली हैं मतलब मोमेंटम या वैल्यू ट्वेंटी इस टाइप की थीम में जाना चाहिए कल्पिन विल यू लाइक टू टेक दिस बिकॉज़ यू डू हैव अ बीटा स्ट्रेटजी राइट या या ओके आई आई स्टिल टेक दैट so you know i i agree that uh, at large uh, in the last few years um, mutual fund uh, the, the large cap funds have not uh, beaten index uh, and to some extent on paper because you know when you look at uh, a lot of these passive funds and their returns and we run uh, you know six to seven passive funds will be launching few more also uh, but the, you know many times we don't do a like to like comparison because uh, in a passive fund also uh, there is uh, its inherent cost uh, plus tracking error Uh, so you know uh, what ends up happening is you may compare xyz large cap fund to the return of nifty but the return of nifty is not the return that you and i can earn because when you invest in a nifty index fund it also will have its own expense of you know anything from 10 to 30 basis point plus a tracking error of 50 to uh, 75 basis point so you know as of now if you ask me i uh, am happy investing generally my approach is i invest in uh, smart beta products which are um which are uh, slight modifications of the index so uh, to give an example uh, you know any index will have good stocks average stocks and poor companies uh, you know an index may have a uh, lot of companies which have actually collapsed or gone to zero or which have got thrown out uh, so smart beta funds you know when they apply certain rules they they code for trying to eliminate uh, some of these um, uh, you know weaker names so they are in a way uh, a closer version of the index uh, they are closer to index in terms of the cost structure and uh, they will own largely what the index has minus uh, you know what your rules want to eliminate and then whatever is eliminated that weight is given to the you know winners or something that you like in the portfolio so in a quality 
driven index fund it will eliminate the weaker quality names and reallocate that to better quality names in a momentum portfolio it will minimize um, you know some of the names which have not done very well in the last 6 months or 1 year and allocate more to momentum so the all these strategies will have their uh, uh, you know place in the sun glory in the sun uh, for some time but they'll keep rotating so right now momentum has been a very strong trade in the last uh, few years so you know we are hearing or talking about momentum but what is important is over a long full cycle uh, through which you are going to stay invested you have to ask that question that what does your belief system agree with so my belief system says that i would at large prefer to invest in active funds because i know how to choose the right active funds i have the temperament to invest in an active fund actually when it underperforms so that when it reverts back to mean uh, i am able to take advantage of past underperformance and future outperformance uh, but for for a lot of common investors new investors you don't have that technique it's better to either go to an index fund or have an advisor who can help you choose the right strategies or learn about the smart beta funds where you know there are different strategies which are uh, uh, modifications of an index so i call smart beta fund as a good index fund where some of the weaker companies or the bad companies get automatically eliminated and uh, you get all the other advantages that typically are there in a passive strategy but i think um, you know you should uh, first learn the pros and cons you should learn when are times when uh, you know uh, index funds outperform when are times they underperform so two years back when um, when only eight stocks of nifty were giving all the returns it was very difficult for a large cap fund or an active fund to outperform but in the last 18 months since the low of covid uh, the rest of the index has done very well uh, and hence uh, you know uh, ability to get back in the game a uh, foreign active fund has become far more easier in the last 18 months or so so there will be rotations like this uh, uh, and hence you should you know have a combination of each of these strategies and time them to some extent if you can understand the rules of timing thanks okay okay sir thank you thank you shri uh, chirag would you want to uh, ask your question please yeah just want to know that uh, for real estate uh, for diversification can one consider reit funds and uh, reit local funds or reit international fund what is the input on that uh, ashish would you want to take that yeah sure so chirag actually you know real estate investment trust rather than uh, you know to so clearly as you might be aware most of them are holding large portfolios or all of them are holding large portfolios of commercial real estate right and uh, that is expected to give them a yield anywhere ranging from 6% to 8% so what you can understand clearly is that it's a yielding asset which means that you should look at it more as a Uh, means to create fixed income or fixed income plus uh, kind of return so real estate investment trusts you know while the underlying is real estate uh, commercial real estate the fact is that uh, it's more relevant for people who are looking at a substitute for uh, you know their fixed income uh, investment and the other important thing to keep in mind is that you know uh, depending on which way interest rates are going depending on which way the trends in commercial real estate are going these yields may fluctuate a bit Uh, but the fact is that it should be seen more as a fixed income substitute uh, and uh, you know when you say that you want to real invest in real estate uh, for example uh, if you are a real estate investor uh, who basically invests in commercial investment commercial real estate seeking a yield then clearly reit is probably a good replacement uh, for you but if you are somebody who is looking to invest in real estate as in uh, you know real, hold on to real estate wait for it to appreciate uh, you know so the equity version of real estate then clearly reit is not uh, relevant for you so i would say that you know definitely reits are a great product i myself have invested in it in the past but that is more from a one one to two year kind of perspective and more as a fixed income replacement or more as a replacement for directly investing in commercial real estate but not really as a investment where one can expect a high return which sometimes people when they invest in real estate you know they want a high return uh, they want a long term investment i think that's not what reit can achieve yeah thank you arvind do you want to uh, go ahead yeah hi uh, thanks for uh, giving me an opportunity i just want to understand uh, 
more on the uh, commodities fund side so i have been invested in a commodity fund for an hour and a half years now it has given good return i am having a ex- i was having expectation that maybe for one more year it, it can grow however uh, with this uh, war uh, thing i am thinking that it may the cycle may go for more than one year i just want to understand your views on this kalpen do you want to take that please yeah sure so you know we we do have a uh, few commodity funds uh, commodity uh, equity funds basically companies which uh, produce these commodities globally uh, especially you know energy companies uh, mining companies or even gold mining companies and uh, our experience has been that um, uh, commodity investments need to be timed because inherently the return on equity of commodity businesses are uh, very volatile and over a very long period they don't uh, sometimes meet even cost of capital and generally commodity companies have a very high amount of leverage plus uh, uh, the 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 owners of commodity companies or the managements of commodity companies end up investing more aggressively when commodity prices are higher and uh, you know end up um, uh, deteriorating the balance sheet so so it, it is a you know cyclical space so one needs a lot of expertise to time it and on the other hand commodity companies in one year can make more returns than what uh, uh, you know high quality consumer companies or banks or insurance companies would make in 10 years if you get the cycle right so the best time to invest in commodity companies is when the underlying commodity prices are you know at a cycle low at a 5 year 7 year or a 10 year low you need to look at long term charts to you know make that assessment and second the stock prices of these companies which are making these commodities also should be at their cycle low if you are able to build a portfolio at those times uh, generally when the cycle turns favorably or positively in the next 2 to 3 years you end up making very good returns um my take like in my own portfolio i i had around uh, 16% of exposure to a mutual fund investing in metal companies uh, global energy companies um, uh, gas companies and so on and so forth and uh, you know in the last 18 months it has been uh, one of the best performing segment uh and because of the war uh, the U- the ukraine attack uh, these prices have run up a lot faster than what they otherwise would have been so to some extent i have taken some profits but at the same time i have still kept the other half for just two or three reasons because these companies are still currently demonstrating lot of discipline of uh, not uh, you know buying out uh, other commodity companies or setting up new plants and taking more debt uh, they are actually uh, improving their balance sheets they are using all the profits coming from high commodity prices uh, to repay their debt and making their balance sheets uh, far more leaner and stronger so that tomorrow when commodity prices were to come down again they are able to navigate that cycle better than the last 10 years the second reason why i still feel you know i i i would own let's say you know 8 to 10% of my portfolio in commodities which is the weight you know all indices globally uh, all benchmarks uh, globally as well as in india have very low weights in commodity stocks so the ownership of these companies is still very very low it is at a 20 year low or almost at a 15 year low i would say so when ownership is very low one of the principle of value investing is to ask that question that if no one is owning it and if the triggers turn favorable these companies can get re-rated and can have some uh, you know better upside than traditional markets so i feel the ownership is still low i feel the commodity cycle is still you know strong uh, you know new uh, the, the supply of uh, underlying commodities is going to take a lot of time to come because in the last 10 years uh, most companies have under invested either in energy assets or you know metal assets because the commodity cycle was very bad so investment portfolios have very low exposure to commodity based companies and uh, you know uh, whenever they are you know showing negative returns in the last 6 months or 1 year i would add it to my portfolio but i would not do the opposite i would not add more when their prices are rising so that's how i look at commodity investing thanks thank you thank you kalpen uh so we'll take one more question we it's already 10 so last question and vivek uh, you can unmute and please ask your question uh, good evening to all i have a question regarding the analysis of the active mutual fund may i know the what are the parameters which one should consider while evaluating the active mutual fund ashish do you want to take that yeah i think you know see i think the most important thing is uh, most important thing is something which is uh, really, i mean you know if you are evaluating active mutual funds critical thing is to evaluate you know the outperformance over a benchmark 
over a reasonable time frame like say 1 year 3 year 5 years 10 years and then of course also the volatility of the out performance so there's something called an information ratio i think that is the uh, you know if there is one number uh, that one needs to really look at then that's the information ratio which in simplistic terms is basically uh, what's the alpha uh, divided by the volatility of the alpha so i think that is there's not much to it uh, really if you ask me uh, the biggest uh, mistake which people make uh, is you know like for example in the last two years there's a lot of uh, hue and cry uh, about active funds underperforming uh, passive funds oh, sorry underperforming the uh, index now i think that uh, if you were to look at data from mid 2018 uh, till mid 2020 then clearly uh, that is the case for a lot of uh, funds but when you just do blind data analysis uh, without providing any context to it then you would jump to wrong conclusions it's a well known fact world over that when economic performance uh, shrinks very rapidly uh, then obviously uh, you know corporate performance also narrows in terms of its breadth and that also gets reflected in the index performance so if you see 2018 to 2020 uh, maybe couple of stocks drove bulk of the return of the benchmark so when economic performance is very very narrow uh, you know active funds will struggle to uh, beat the benchmark so you can definitely use uh, you know uh, you can use the statistical measure that i described to you but uh, you must definitely use it over a longer time frame and you must also uh, keep uh, you know underlying market context in mind because based on 2018 to 2020 data if you were to conclude that all active funds are bad then in 2021 uh, you would actually have to you know revisit uh, that statement the other thing which i have seen is that lot of uh, you know it's great that you're asking you know what data to look at uh, which is good you should always look at data but lot of times conclusions in the indian market are also drawn based on us data which also is uh, totally wrong Uh, the reason is because in us the market construct is different i'll just give you one simple statistic in last 25 years in us the market cap has gone up 3x but the number of listed companies has become half so in us you know financial industry is known for uh, innovation and very smart innovation so in the us it's not so much about active money going into passive the only thing they have done is that they have stripped off the alpha they are selling alpha under alternates and they are selling the beta under passives in reality from active funds money has gone to alternates and to passives so important to keep context in mind so never apply us data to make india conclusions uh, never uh, look at very narrow time frames uh, you know for evaluation but as far as statistics is concerned i think uh, information ratio is the right thing to look at uh thanks uh, thanks ashish uh i think we are really uh, running short of time so uh thank you so much uh, kalpen and uh, ashish for joining us today and for simplifying uh, uh mutual funds and investing for our audience and uh, it was a pleasure having both of you as our guests today and uh, thanks a lot china for uh, being a wonderful host thank you everyone thanks for inviting me see you good night Thank, thank you, you thank, thank you for the thank, thank you Ashish thank you everyone for joining have a good night good night